oftentimes as Christians, our relationship with the Lord is not strong enough to handle the disappointments that we are facing. We are in lesson number seven of our teaching on how to move forward. And we're using Philippians chapter three to guide us. Paul here says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Church, we have learned over the last several weeks that when we talk about how to move forward, we're talking about how do we make continued progress? How do we make sure that we are continuing to reach forward and forgetting those things that are past? We're talking about how to make consistent progress. And we've learned that consistently making progress can be difficult. And I don't want any member of my church, any person under my authority, to get stuck in a place in your heart and in your mind where you're just reliving and revisiting the same things over and over again and unable to move forward. So the intent of this teaching is to help us. I want to help us to move forward in the instructions of God. I want to help us to grow and to develop. I want to help us to make progress. I'm taking this teaching out of things that I have learned and experienced over my life. And I have seen how God has worked through my life and the lives of others to help them to move forward. And I want to take those things and give them to you. The purpose of this teaching is threefold. First of all, I want us to glorify God. That is, I want us to honor him with our lives. I want us secondly to remain in his will because the will of God is always in front of us. And I want us to mature. That is to become perfected, to develop. And so the goal of this teaching is to reach the mark. And the mark in this teaching, as we're defining it, is the will of God for this and every dispensation of time in our lives. And so we're looking at five areas. We want to learn how to move forward from our old life, we want to learn how to move forward from loss. We want to learn how to move forward from disappointment. We want to learn how to move forward when we miss God. And we want to learn how to move forward from a stagnant place. So you have your Bibles. I'm going to ask you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. You'll have some time to get there. And so we've been looking for the last couple of weeks on how to move forward from disappointment in life we will have disappointment. And how we handle it is essential. In life, we will have disappointment. And how we handle it is essential. You're not going to live a disappointment-free life. You're not going to live a life uh, where you don't have some things happen to you that are not what you had hoped and not what you had expected. And so when we face disappointments, we have to know how to deal with each and every disappointment and then how to move on. And so we've been focusing on basically three aspects. Sometimes we're disappointed because of past experiences, meaning we've gone through something in the past and that past experience was not what we expected. It's not what we hoped. It's not what we anticipated would happen in our lives. Sometimes we face disappointment because of our present situation. We just feel that we are in a situation that wasn't what we hoped, wasn't what we would desire. And as a result, we feel hurt. We feel sadness because of our present state. And sometimes we feel disappointed because of our perceived future. In other words, we look at maybe what's happened in the past or where we are at present, and we just feel like the future just doesn't look good. Tomorrow just doesn't have any promise to it. It doesn't have the hope that I thought, and we can feel disappointed. And so we said there were three things we wanted to look at in order to move forward from disappointment. Let's go back through the first two 
and then we'll talk about the third. We said, first of all, I have to reconcile my situation with the truth. To move forward from disappointment, I have to reconcile my situation with the truth. And we looked at some statements under that. We said, first of all, we've all experienced suffering. We've all gone through pain and trauma and di difficult times. And, you know, uh, we got to get out of this, oh, it, it happened to me, or things always happen to me, or why did this happen to me? Listen, life happens to everybody. Disappointments happen to everybody. No, nobody has exactly everything the way they want it. Uh, it, it they, they, nobody uh, has had everything go exactly the way they desire. And all of us, if we live long enough, will have people say things or do things or cause things in our lives that cause us to be disappointed. So we have to realize, listen, everybody, saint and sinner, good person, bad, you know, we say, they're such a good person. Why did that have to happen to them? Listen, things happen to good people, things happen to bad people, things happen to okay people, things happen. We've all gone through things. Now what happens is when we think we're a good person and something happens to us, we feel like we didn't deserve it. And when some, the same thing happens to somebody who we've decided is a bad person, we feel like we, they earned it. Now, see, that's the problem. But the reality is we all go through sufferings. But we have hope because we have a Father who loves us. We have a, a Jesus, an intercessor who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. We have the Holy Spirit. We're in the body of Christ. We have one another. We have hope. And God can still be glorified. You know, don't allow what has happened in your life to cause you to believe that God can't get glory out of your life, that you can't honor him with your life. And not only can God uh, still get glory, but we are still in his plans. No matter how disappointing a life situation may be, you're still in God's plans. There may be some adjustments you may have to make. There may be some corrections that you have to make, but we're still in God's plans. And listen, we can still have the victory. We can still have the victory. And so the second thing we learned, and we spent nearly all Bible study on this last week, is that I must forgive. I must forgive. When I go through disappointment, oftentimes uh, when, I, when, I, when something happens and it doesn't meet my expectations, it's not what I hoped. And I'm not trying to minimize what you feel you may have gone through, but the reality is it doesn't matter if you think it's the worst thing that could have happened or somebody else thinks it's the smallest thing that had has happened. If you're hurt, if you're disappointed, and you feel that somebody caused that hurt or that disappointment, you have to forgive. You have to forgive. We learned last week that forgiveness is an inside work. It's an internal work. That, that is, I have to get it right in my heart. I, I have to get things right on the inside. Forgiveness is a heart condition. Forgiveness is a heart condition. It's about my heart and my heart being right towards that person and my heart being right towards a holy God. Forgiveness has to do with my position with my heavenly father because he said, if I don't forgive, I can't be forgiven. He said, if I don't forgive, my prayers are hindered. So forgiveness is an inside work. And one of the, I think the mistakes we sometimes make is we think that forgiveness is about the other person. Forgiveness is not really about the other person. Forgiveness is about what God is trying to do on the inside of you. Forgiveness is not about what the other person may say or do in response to the fact that you have forgiven them. Listen, you can forgive somebody and they don't even know, believe, or accept that you have forgiven them. Let me say that again. You can forgive somebody and they may not even know, believe, or accept that you have forgiven them. It's not really about them. It's not, you know, because what we want to do is we want to go and convince them. I, I forgave you. I, I, I'm not, listen, it's not about them. It's about us and God. It's about an internal work. It's about us being in right standing with God. It's about us not having uh, malice, anger, bitterness, and strife and contention in our heart. Amen? Because here's the reality. It, it, if a situation, as many situations are, are, is still is contentious, and uh, you can say whatever you want to say is about your heart, the person's not going to believe it. 
So it's really not about, you know, what well, they got to, they got, and it's not about them forgiving you. Uh, you know, what well, they got, I forgave them, but they haven't, they haven't forgiven me. Doesn't, it doesn't matter. This is about what's on the inside. This is about an internal work. This is about making sure that I am right on the inside. And so forgiveness is about me moving forward. Forgiveness is about me moving forward. And I'm spending a few minutes in this review because I really want to make sure uh, that we had a correct interpretation of what I taught last week. Forgiveness is not the same as the relationship. Forgiveness is not the same as the relationship. Some re listen, some relationships are altered and won't ever be as they were. Forgiveness is not about the relationship that I have with a person. And forgiveness is not, okay, I've forgiven you, so you stole my TV last time you were here. Come on over this time, and pray, I'm praying you don't steal my stereo. No, that, that's, not, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't have anything to do with whether I trust a person or don't trust a person. Last uh, week, I used the example of my wife. If my wife and I, if one of us has ought towards the other, not only do we have to forgive, but we have to work to restore the relationship because we've made an unconditional lifetime commitment to God to stay with one another. If my child does something uh, I have that is disappointing to me, I have to forgive my child. You know why? Because I have to train that child up in the way that they should go. I have to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and I can't do that if I have anger or bitterness or malice or contention. Now, when I say child, I mean the literal definition of a child. Amen? Because you don't raise grown-ups. That's a whole nother teaching. But see, you, you don't raise grown-ups. You let grown-ups be grown-ups. Amen? That's how you raise a grown-up. You let them know that you're grown now. Amen? So you make some choices and you get the consequences. That, that's, how you, that's how you continue to mature a grown-up. But a child, and they, listen, there are people whose children, minors, have done things and it was disappointing. And if we're honest, we held it, we hold it in our heart, and we have to be able to forgive, amen? And in those cases, there has to be a restoration, not only uh, in your heart, but also in the relationship, because your parental responsibility is not over, amen? Does that make sense to everybody? Now, I want to give us an example. When, when God, when Adam sinned in the garden, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God forgave them, but it altered the relationship. You know, God forgave Adam and Eve, but he also put them out. He, amen? Put them out the house. You, you leave in the garden. <laughs> and, and unlike many of us parents, he, did, he closed the door, locked it up, guarded it with angels and said, you ain't ever coming back to this house. But God forgave Adam. If God had not forgiven man, he would have never sent Jesus. So he forgave us, but the relationship was altered. God, listen, God forgave Moses. But he said, Moses, you went too far this time. You're not going into the promised land. God forgave uh, Abraham. But Abraham still had to deal with the fact that he had Ishmael. See, God, God, God forgives, but it often, when, when, uh, even though God forgives us, it can change the nature of the relationship between us and God because choices and actions have consequences. So if our actions can be forgiven by a holy God, but we can see in the Bible that that forgiveness, God didn't allow David to build the temple. He said, David, you, you've done too much now. I, the, our, you're, he said, the same God said, David, you are a man after my own heart. And I love you. He even told David, he said, I forgive you. You're not going to die, but you're not building the temple either. The relationship was altered. So oftentimes when things happen, we have to forgive, but it doesn't mean that the relationship may be restored the way it was before whatever happened, happened. And the same is true when you do something to somebody. They got a responsibility to forgive you, but you may have altered the relationship that you're going to have with that person. That's not an aspect of forgiveness. That's an, that's an aspect of position. 
and actions can cause us to be put in different positions. And it doesn't matter if there's forgiveness. Uh, there are many times, and I tell you, it's, uh, I'm always touched when, when a family who's a victim of crime uh, will go to court and stand and, and say to the person who committed the crime, we forgive you. But then the judge says 15 to 20. Right. So, so the, the forgiveness, they don't say we forgive you, so therefore come on home with us and say, it's a good thing the family has forgiven you. And you can take that as some comfort while you serve in this time. So there are two different things. And I, I, I really wanted to make sure that we had that in our hearts. So at some point, I'm going to go back and I'm going to teach us on relationships. And I'm going to teach us all the different types of relationships we have and how to manage those relationships in a way that glorifies God. That's not the intent of this teaching. The intent of this teaching is to teach us to move forward. Amen? All right. So we said to forgive means that I must let it go. I have to let it go. Because I can't hold on to things and move forward. I have to let it be. Stop going around over and over and over in my mind. And we said one of the ways to let it be is to stop repeating it, both to yourself and to others. Just let it be. You know, things can heal when you let them be. Th things can heal when you let them be. But if you constantly go back around and around and around, it's hard to let it be. Then you have to leave it alone. We said leave it alone literally means to move away, to move away. So, sometimes to forgive, you just have to move away from the situation. You have to move away from the person. You have to move away from what happened. You just have to create some space, whether that's spiritually, physically, or naturally. Sometimes you just have to move away. It doesn't mean that you don't love the person. It doesn't mean you don't care about the situation. It just means in order to get your heart right with an almighty God, in order to make sure you are clean on the inside, you have to move away. Because sometimes you can't let it be and let it go until you leave it alone. I'm going to say that again. Because sometimes you can't let it be and let it go until you leave it alone. It, you know, if I move away, then I can't pick at it. I can't keep revisiting it. I can't keep going around and around. Why? Because I have let it alone. I have moved away. If you are, listen, if you are married, you can understand this in a natural sense. You know, sometimes... You just got to go to a different room. It don't mean you're going to get a divorce. And it doesn't mean you don't love your spouse. You, but you realize that if we stay in this room, we're going to keep revisiting this. We're going to keep going round and round, over and over, about the same thing. Let's use my lighthearted example of what did, what did I say? Did I say book or chapter? Now, that wasn't a real argument. That was just something that, you know, that was a funny story. But let's say it was something that I was determined that I saw it one way, and she was determined that she saw it another way. Well, at some point, you know, you may just have to move away. You know, one person go to the kitchen, the other person go and do something in the basement. Why? Because if we stay here, the urge to just say some, one more sentence, amen? Y'all know one more sentence syndrome, right? That this the urge to just say one more sentence. And, you know, one more sentence is going to lead the other person to have the urge to say one more sentence. Because, you know, one more sentence is contagious. It's like yawning. You know, once you yawn, then the other person yawns. You know, well, I'll just end with this. Oh, you're going to end? You have a closing statement? Well, then I'm just going to end with this. Well, now that you have ended with that, then I just want to come back and just restate one more time for the record. Oh, now it's not an ending statement, it's the record. So since we're putting it on the record, I just want to come back. Sometimes you just have to move away. It's good for your heart. It's good for your heart, amen? And then we have to give up the debt. We have to give up the debt. They owe me, I deserve, I'm worth. Listen, what you're worth and what you deserve and what you have are never going to equal the same thing. What, what you have and what you're worth and what you deserve, they're never going to equal. They're never going to. So you have, to, you have to give up the debt. Amen? And so that brings us to our third thing. If I'm able to see it from God's perspective and I'm able to forgive, then thirdly, I must encourage myself. I must encourage myself. 
That is, I have to strengthen myself. To, to encourage just means to strengthen. Encourage literally means to give courage. You know, sometimes you have to give yourself courage. Sometimes you have to give yourself strength. Strength and ability are almost synonymous. To encourage means to become resolute or resolved. To become resolute or resolved. You know, you, have you ever been nervous or scared or fearful to do something and people are trying to talk you into doing it and it's, that's not helping? You know, come on, you can do it, huh? but you're nervous about it. You know, maybe for somebody it was going some, into something that was high because you were afraid of heights or maybe it was swim water because you were afraid of the water or whatever it is. You know, all of us have something. Maybe it was facing the basement because last time you were down there you saw a big spider or you saw... Uh, a mouse or you saw, you know, something that looked like a snake go off and going, you're like, and you got to go back down. And, and, you know, people say, you, well, you have to go down there and you, you just, no matter what anybody says, you're stuck. And if you've ever been in that situation for any reason over anything, you realize that the only way to get unstuck is you have to unstick yourself. Because everybody saying you can do it is not going to get you to do it. At, at some point, you have to muster up the strength and the courage and the resolve to do it yourself. Whatever that thing is or whatever that thing was, well, it's the same thing when we face disappointment. It's good that people may want to encourage us and tell us it's okay and, you know, you can do it and, you know, it, it's going to be all right. But at, at some point, you have to have the internal strength and courage and resolve to get moving for yourself. Amen? And, and so there are times where we have to encourage ourselves because there's nobody really around us that's going to give us the resolve that we need to make the decisions that we need to make or to do the work that we need to do. We just have to have the courage to do it from within. And so we encourage ourselves in the Lord. We encourage ourselves in the Lord. So I don't want us to think that what I'm about to teach is the power of positive thinking or the power of uh, getting your mental aptitude together. We encourage ourselves in the Lord. That is, we encourage ourselves out of the relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. We encourage ourselves out of the relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. That is, that's so why it's so important to reconcile the situation with the truth, because I'm going to encourage myself based out of the fact that I have a God who loves me. His son dwells in me. I have a relationship with him. He has promised that nothing can separate me from his love. He has promised me that if I am right with him and I'm in his will, that I have the victory. I can trust in him with all of my heart, and he'll, he's going to lead and guide and direct me through this situation. I have to trust that he has a will and a plan for my life. And I can draw courage and strength and resolve out of that relationship. And then the Holy Spirit will then strengthen me to be whatever it is that God needs me to be and to do whatever it is that God needs me to do to move forward. But we encourage ourselves out of the relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. So if I am struggling... To move forward, remember I said you have to do everything you know to do. If I'm struggling to move forward from a disappointment, I need to make sure that I have spent sufficient time strengthening my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I have to make sure that I am trusting and relying on the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of me, that empowers me to be who God has called me to be and do what God has called me to do. Oftentimes, as Christians, listen to what I'm getting ready to say. Oftentimes, as Christians, our relationship with the Lord is not strong enough to handle the disappointments that we are facing. And so I'm going to continue to struggle to move forward until I can strengthen the relationship that I have with an almighty God. And, and so what happens is disappointments tend to mount themselves one on top of the other. This happened and this happened. I mean, just let's go back to March of 2020 till today. 
you know, disappointments have just been kind of piling on top of each other. First it was the pandemic. Then it was the changes on my job. Then it was what's happening with my children. Then it was school won't let me come. Then it was school lets me come, but only two days a week. Then it was I came two days a week and they sent, us, sent all the children home. Then it was I don't have child care. Then it was, you know, it was just one disappointment after another disappointment after another disappointment after another disappointment. And what happens is if my relationship with God is not strong, it will be hard to encourage myself. There's a reason why stress, anxiety, and depression are on the rise during this time, not in the street, in the church. I would expect that anxiety and stress and depression would be on the rise in the world because they don't have Jesus. But those things are on the rise in the church. When I say the church, I mean the body of Christ as a whole, maybe not you as an individual. It's a reason why Many of us, when uh, the pandemic started, uh, we were excited to be home and we lost weight, but now that the pandemic is dragging on, we're packing on weight. Because a lot of what we're packing on is stress eating. Because we thought it would be over by now. We thought things would be back to normal by now. We, we thought we wouldn't be dealing with this anymore. You know, th there's, there's a reason why uh, in the beginning some of us were happy to have some extra time with our spouse, but now we're starting to, you know, when are they going to call me back to the job? <laughs> and, and so, listen, when things get discouraging, we have to know how to encourage ourselves. And I, I wanna, I'm going to make, I don't think I've said this statement publicly. I've said it privately uh, to, to pastors and others to help prepare their hearts. And I might as well start saying it to you. I believe that we are at the beginning of a sustained period of difficult times.